How do you uh, what happened? What do you use as a parathis? I have to get a bigger head. <laughs> Det er ikke noe god lyd i det der, altså. Bare ikke det? Nei. Ikke her foran, i hvert fall. John, kan du høre meg? Først, det er veldig bra å gi en talk. Så du gir en andre talk. Det er ikke noe som skal være så bra som den første. Særlig at den andre talk, til en eksterne, touches på den som jeg ga i dag. Og det er ikke noe som skal være så bra som den andre. Jeg prøver å skippe over det. Men hvis jeg repeter mine jokes, jeg prøver å gjøre dem en sånn few as possible. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to talk about is really not only related to teacher education. It is really about the whole question of virtual higher education. The question of turning higher education, university or college teaching, into <coughs> virtual distance learning, a distance learning phenomenon. And what I'd like to do is really use good old marks. A, a thesis, an antithesis, and a prosthesis. I'm sorry, synthesis. <laughs> okay, so let me begin. And I'll, uh, there are a few people here of literature, so I'll begin with um, Victor Hugo. And from his book, uh, Notre Dame de Paris, 1482, uh, and he says the following. Opening the window of his cell, he pointed to the immense church of Notre Dame, which with its twin towers, stone walls, and monstrous copula, the archdeacon pondered the giant edifice for a few moments in silence. Then, with a sigh, he stretched his right hand towards the printed book, that lay on his table to remind you printed books were something very new then. Printed book that lay on his table and his left hand towards Notre Dame and turned a, t a sad eye from the book to the church. Alas, he said, peace, the book, will destroy that, the church. Some people, and I have some colleagues, claim the way to be the same case now. This internet, virtual learning, virtual teaching, distance education will destroy that. The citadel, the university. Others say, will not destroy it. It will really renovate it, revive it. Higher education for at least 2,500 years used to be the ivory tower, used to be the remote citadel, castle on the mountain, remote, distant, dignified, elitist. There was very little knowledge and there were very few people who knew anything. Knowledge was rare. Knowledge was precious. You had to make a pilgrimage to go up to the mountain to sit at the feast of the professors. Those who knew anything, you had to totally dedicate yourself to studying, getting away from the daily hustle bustle of your life, of the farm, of the city, of the family. You had to become a student which was a full-time job, if you want, a profession. Studying higher education did not mix with making a living, or certainly not with raising children. <laughs> higher education always had three components. The first component was the preservation of knowledge. We know it under the name of library. That is where we keep the knowledge. Some people I know, <laughs> friends of mine, say it's a very interesting thing. Knowledge never, never leaves higher education. <coughs> the professors keep it to themselves. They lock it up in the library. The students forget it the next morning after they had an examination. And hence, knowledge is well preserved within the walls of higher education. That's a joke. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Think for a moment, I'm now in a thesis, what's called a thesis. Why should we become virtual? Think of the cost of life purchasing or maintaining a library. Just to give an idea. Some 12 years ago, I allowed myself the luxury of buying the Cyclopedia Britannica. It cost me then $1,500, sort of, it has only a few kilometers on it, second version, you know, second hand, like a car. Uh, it has, still has, 37 volumes. You need a special room, not to mention a special bookshelf, etc. for it. But if it's in your living room, it obviously shows how educated the person you are. <laughs> a few years later, you could buy a disc, $500. The whole Cyclopedia Britannica on a single disc that you cannot show in your living room anymore. <laughs> now for fifty dollars a year you subscribe to it on the internet. You don't even need a disc. There isn't a single library in the world that would not prefer that for the simple reason. Libraries don't have shelf space anymore for the books and the journals. Any one of you who is subscriber to journals knows very well how much money and space they take. Let me give you an idea. The first one million abstracts in chemistry, it took them 30 years to accumulate, from 1907 to 1937. The recent million abstract took about one and a half years. The first million abstracts cost, in the price of 1940, $12. <coughs> I've checked with the library now. It cost 17500 the most recent million. <coughs> no library can allow itself to pay such a price. That's only in chemistry. What about biology, microbiology, medicine, you name it. Nobody's got either the money or the space to put things in the library as we used to, which really means we have to go virtual. The second thing, which is typical of all universities ever was, I mean, going back to Hammurabi, going back to the old library in Alexandria, that was knowledge production. We develop knowledge, we do research, we produce knowledge, and then we dirty the journals, I fill the journals. What it means re really today, the process of knowledge production is an increased specialization. Worldwide communities of teachers, scholars, teacher trainers, teacher trainees uh, become established. If you think of all the new interdisciplinary fields, microbiology, uh, uh, biotechnology, cognitive sciences, brain sciences and the like. All these are new communities that sprang up in the last 20, 30 years or so, and many of them greatly depend on not being neighbors in the same hallway or corridor of the college or university, but rather international communities of people who interact with each other electronically. In fact, come to think of it, at least in my case, like in, I know, numerous other cases, the scholars who sit next to me in my university, so we can have coffee together, etc. We have no common interest whatsoever. But I do have common interest with colleagues at Harvard, in Moscow, Tokyo, Oslo, and the like, and we are a very knit community. In other words, science today could not develop, could not progress if you couldn't have the development of new uh, interdisciplinary groups of, an, of scholars relating to each other electronically. <laughs> Just to give you another angle to the knowledge production. When I was a student at Stanford in 1968, Kronbach, His Majesty Kronbach, 
told us the students, if we want to be updated, we better look into five journals in our field, the field of educational psychology. And we better know what, at least what the content tables <coughs> say. I was an editor later of one of these journals, but that was already the time when it, you had to know more or less what's going on in at least 50 journals. If you can't have them <coughs> online, you are lost. APA, the American Psychological Association, allows you today, if you are a member, for $99 a year to read all the articles published by the American Psychological Association and its journals since 1887. Do you understand what that means? I can read William James, what he wrote in 1902. <coughs> I could not possibly have it in the library. And then the thing that is of greatest interest to us, and that is knowledge transmission, or what's called in French, teaching. <coughs> teaching in general, if you want teacher training more specifically. Come to think of the cost of face-to-face -face teaching today. I skip you. I can tell you that if we <coughs> have easy access, <laughs> we want. We couldn't pay for professor. <coughs> Teach for instructors. To give an idea what it costs, I have it, uh, I don't have it here on the slide. Uh, the cost of a professor for uh, an instructor at the college level for a year is an unbelievable sum of money if you throw in Social Security and all the other benefits. And given the growth of higher education and of teacher training, possibly the system could never really pay for it. The conclusion is of the thesis, not yet the antithesis. <coughs> Add to it what we had said yesterday from Herbert Simon, I won't repeat it, that knowledge today changes its meaning from being something of possession to something of access. We talk about today a situation in which knowledge can be, can seep out from you, the university or the college, to every living room, cheaply. One can learn everything from everywhere. If you want to learn today political science together with sociology, you can take courses from Syracuse University, then from Hong Kong, and sort of top it with a course from Beirut and have a degree. And in Europe in particular, where the Erasmus and other programs are designed to allow somebody, everybody, to build a course of study like with little mosaic stones from here, from there, from everywhere. And gradually <coughs> home and receive a degree in everything without even leaving home. We are talking about studying whenever one chooses. You can raise your children, your husband, and your dog, <laughs> and then at, at, at night sit and study, or in the morning, or send them to the grandparents for the weekend, and dedicate the weekend to studies whenever you choose. You don't depend on any class schedule. You can do it when we talk of democratization of education. Here we have it. It's not anymore a matter of elitism where the few who can afford it do not have to earn money, or the government is uh, generous enough to support them, they can study, the rest cannot. The cost of the individual in this respect is minuscule. Really very low cost. In short, it's what we be, somebody came to call it the, the age of urgency. Everything can be done now and fast.